Hi, my name is Kevin Ahern, and I'm a professor of biochemistry at Oregon State University. Without blood clotting, we're not here. Blood clotting is a remarkable thing. We can cut ourselves and go from a state where we have no blood clotting going on to forming a clot in a matter of minutes. And in that matter of minutes, that clot that forms, forms from proteins that are floating around the bloodstream that aren't forming the clot in the absence of the injury. And they're forming a watertight seal in minutes. And they're forming it from proteins. It's, it's absolutely remarkable. We don't want those clots forming in the absence of injury because that's known as causing a stroke or causing a heart attack when they occur, when those clots occur in the wrong places. Most of what I will focus your attention on will be the end of the process, where the cells are actually forming the clot. Let's turn our attention to uh, the blood clotting process. I like to start with this one because this figure shows us that the clotting process has two big features. One feature is called the cellular response. And it's actually the first response that happens when an injury occurs. Okay? The very first thing that happens when you cut yourself or you uh, hurt yourself in some way is the cellular response. And the cellular response manifests itself through blood platelets. Now the blood platelets do a variety of things, but one of the most important things that they do is that they start plugging that hole. They don't completely plug it, but they start the plugging process and in doing so, they start the other process going, which is the uh, molecular response. The molecular response you see on the screen is a much bigger response, and it's ultimately what forms the clot. Now, it's in that molecular response that a lot of detail comes up, okay? A lot of details popping up in that molecular response. I want you to focus your attention down on the end of the process. I want you to focus your attention on the bottom of that because fibrin is a molecule, it's a protein molecule that forms polymers and those polymers form the clot. So when you see a blood clot that is, you know, a clot that, that is on your skin or something, that's a polymer of fibrin. Now I'm not going to talk about the details, fibrin actually has uh, two different subunits that form the polymer. I'm not going to go through that detail with you. But you should know that fibrin is made, uh, uh, the, the, the fibrin uh, units go together to make a polymer. You also see on that screen that fibrin comes from a zymogen known as fibrinogen. And that's to the right on the screen. And you can see that fibrinogen um, is converted into fibrin by this protein known as thrombin. And you can see that thrombin has a zymogen form known as prothrombin. Now, I'm repeating those because those are the central parts of the clotting process that we'll focus on. Okay? So we've got two zymogens there that are very important, prothrombin and fibrinogen. There's a third, and I'll call it a different name later. You see it on that bottom screen, it says, XIIIA, that stands for 13A. And throughout these figures that I'll be showing you, wherever you see the subscript A, that means active. So for example, factor 13 is converted into an active form by action of thrombin, just like fibrinogen is converted into fibrin by action of thrombin. The cellular response starts, and that's, that's where we're going to start the process, the cellular response starts as a result of damaged epi epithelial tissue. Epithelial tissue the, the, uh, is found in a variety of places in our bodies, but the most important one for this process is it lines the blood vessels. Epithelial tissue lines the blood vessels. As long as the epithelial tissue remains intact, the clotting system sees no reason to clot hopefully, right? And when the epithelial tissue gets damaged, as what happens when you cut yourself or you bang yourself in some way, that damages the epithelial tissue and it expo exposes the next layer 
which is collagen. Collagen, of course, being connective tissue. And it's the exposure of collagen that tells the body we need to start the clotting process. Okay? So there's the very first signal that says it's time to start the clotting. All right, now, several things happen as collagen gets exposed. Platelets bind to the collagen using collagen binding surface receptors that they have. And platelets, as I said, are these blood cells that are going to try to form a plug of some sort to start the process. The cellular response is a prelude to the molecular response. And the cellular response is telling the molecular response, hey, we've got to do something here. This figure I like to show because it depicts two parts of the molecular response. The first part being the, the, what's called the contact activation or the intrinsic pathway. The second part being the tissue factor pathway, or what's called the extrinsic pathway. These are separate pathways, and they have separate stimuli, which I won't really talk about. They both involve trauma. Okay? But the important point about these pathways isn't the individual steps in the extrinsic or the intrinsic pathways, but rather the fact that they converge to stimulate the things I told you about earlier the conversion of prothrombin to make thrombin, the conversion of fibrinogen to make fibrin, and the activation of this factor 13A. Okay? Okay. But we're focusing again on the prothrombin going to thrombin, the thrombin catalyzing the conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin, and the, the um, conversion of fibrin into a stable clot. That's actually what factor 13A does, and we'll see that in just a bit. Well, let's look at the molecular response a little bit more closely. I love this electron micrograph, by the way. That is an actual clot, and you can see blood cells embedded in that clot. It gives you an idea about, wow, that is a, an incredible tangle uh, that is actually there. That tangle is watertight, will not leak water. Of course, you know that with, with blood clotting. All right, so the molecular response converges on the polymerization of fibrin, which is what I've already told you. And that comes from the action of both the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways that come together to activate as much fibrin as possible, as quickly as possible, but not too much, because too much will be a problem. And that's probably why there's such complexity in these pathways, because it allows for fine tuning in terms of amount of clotting that's actually needed. We convert fibrinogen into fibrin by action of thrombin. If we have a ton of thrombin, we're going to have a ton of fibrin. And fibrin is a self-polymerizing molecule. Self-polymerizing. It's like a jigsaw puzzle putting itself together. We talk about nanomachines, and we think what nanomachines can do. A self-polymerizing molecule is a nanomachine. It's assembling itself into a longer and longer polymer. We've made a polymer of fibrin and that polymer isn't the final clot, okay? The polymer is not the final clot. The clot actually requires stabilization. So the polymer forms, but the polymer doesn't hold itself together well. Little pieces stick into each other and so forth. But to hold the polymer together, you need covalent crosslinks. And the covalent crosslinks happen as a result of action of an enzyme known as a transglutaminase, and transglutaminase is factor 13A that we saw before, that thrombin actually activated. Okay? What the enzyme does, what transglutaminase does, it catalyzes the joining of the amine groups okay, off of um, uh, glutamine all right, to the, the, the carboxamide, the, meat, the amine is lost in the process, but the carboxamide of a glutamine to the amine side chain of lysine. That's what's happening in the top reaction. You can see that the ammonia is released, and we form a covalent bond between the first polypeptide chain of fibrin and the second polypeptide chain of fibrin. So the bond between the carboxamide part of glutamine, which is on the left, to the amine of lysine, which is on the right, is a covalent bond. 
any time in space you have an lysine adjacent to a glutamine, this reaction will occur. So we got this, you saw that mess and tangle of a clot that we had in that electron micrograph. You could imagine there's going to be a ton of these individual side chains that may be close to each other, and they're going to be joined in a covalent bond. This is called hardening of the clot, and the hardening of the clot is necessary for the clot to be stable. And if you ever cut yourself and you know, ever look at a clot closely, you'll see the very first thing that forms is fairly fluid. It's not hard as it gets later. And that hardening is happening as a result of the process you see here. Now, the bottom part of that figure shows you how, you, how the process can be reversed. I won't go into that because I'm going to talk about an enzyme that does that later. This schematically shows you what's happening. Okay? All right. This is showing you what's happening um, with the uh, overall thing. And we have the top or the middle figure there where it says fibrin mesh. That's the polymer that has started to form. And then the factor 13A, the transglutaminase, causes covalent bonds to be formed. And they're shown as diagonals in that figure. So all those cross-linked covalent bonds stabilize the clot. Okay. 